Let's just have to wait. Yeah, it's always a pain getting that thing to work. I remember last time was the same. Right. Okay, we are live. Okay. So um, it's a pleasure to uh, welcome Professor Frank Spano from Temple University right from his home. Early in the morning, we have caught him uh, and I convinced him to give us a Wednesday Colloquium. So I welcome all of you for this session, for this exciting session on Wednesday Colloquium. Um, and before I formally introduce uh, uh, Professor Spano, I would like to just give a brief uh, historical background of the Wednesday Colloquium series. Um, actually, the Wednesday Colloquium uh, is as old as the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research in terms of its being. Um, ever since uh, Professor Homi Baba, the founding director, uh, 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 nuclear physicist, started this, uh, this institute, he has been a big um, sort of a proponent of all the sciences getting together in one day, one afternoon, and listening to, uh, you know, fantastic expositions of the latest science by experts from all around the world. So he was successful in getting people here in person to deliver colloquia. Um, um, and uh, this entire culture of bringing together physicists, chemists, and biology started um, and, and, and propagated so well for all these uh, years of our existence. So, um, so this is just for uh, introduction so that Frank, you have a little bit of an uh, um, historical perspective. This, uh, this, this has been a big series for us. We always uh, look forward every Wednesday um, to um, latest and the current trends in uh, scientific world. Um, and um, I, I hope today is, it's no different and I'm sure. So um, now for the audience here, um, a brief introduction to Professor Spano's uh, background and work. Uh, Professor Spano comes to us from Temple University. Um, he did his bachelor's or undergrad uh, from Lehigh University in physics. Um, and after finishing his um, undergraduate degree in 1982, he went to Princeton, um, Princeton for his uh, PhD work with uh, Professor Warren Warren. And that's where he actually got into both experimental and a computational side of coherent spectroscopy um, and um, femtosecond spectroscopy. And that, that, that was Professor Warren's major activity apart from the NMR work that came on later as well. Um, uh, uh, Professor Spano worked in various aspects in um, uh, uh, Warren's lab, uh, and he actually got into uh, the computational aspects uh, and specially worked after his PhD with one of the leaders in the community of multidimensional spectroscopy, uh, Professor Shaul Mukamel. One of his students is, of course, a faculty colleague of ours here, Professor mm -hmm. Ravi Venkatramani. Ravi, could you say hi? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's, um, and um, uh, after finishing his postdoc for two years, right, uh, Frank? Uh, almost two, two years, years from 88 to old, The old fashioned time period. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He took up a position in Temple where he's there ever since. And uh, one of the most fascinating aspects of uh, uh, Professor Spano's work in Temple has been his, um, you know, sort of a um, incredible effort to put together a good understanding of optical excitations in um, organic systems, as well as in aggregates. Um, he has come up with fantastic redefinition of the Kasha's aggregate ideas, and um, and 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 really extend that at work to the level that we can now use it routinely um, in many systems across in chemistry. And especially it is important because we all know we have to harness excitations in device context. And on all devices, when, a, when you put molecules, they're all in aggregates in some form. So, so thank you, Professor Spano, for doing that for all of us and <laughs> teaching us about so much about aggregates and uh, the excitations in aggregates. So today, uh, Professor Spano is going to talk about excitons and polarons, means charges in organic materials. Um, Frank, you can go ahead. Wow, so thank you so much for that introduction, uh, JD, or should I say Professor uh, Desgupta. 
Um, I will say, or maybe some of you know, I gave a talk at uh, the Indian Institute of Science a couple of months ago in November. And right after, that was right during our uh, elections, if you remember that. And it was really tense and anxious. And uh, I remember talking to JD about what Georgia was doing and counting votes and super, super anxious. And now, of course, a couple of months later, we've had this horrific event of a couple of days ago with the insurrection and everybody's on pins and needles and super anxious. And so I just have one favor to ask JD, please don't invite me back <laughs> every time <laughs> something bad is happening. So um, I, I'm anyway. sure it's going to be fine. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's absolutely tremendous honor to be invited to uh, give this uh, seminar at uh, the uh, Pattaya Institute of uh, Fundamental Research. And I absolutely love that word fundamental because that's, uh, that's what I do is fundamental uh, excitations, as you can see in the title, excitons and polarons and organic materials. So um, I'd like to tell you today about something that just uh, some new stuff, uh, relatively new, uh, where we have a kind of a unifying uh, idea or, or model, I should say, uh, that treats both polarons, which are charged excitations, and I'll focus just on what we call holes, which are positive charges, and excitons, which are neutral excited species. And both these uh, these uh, quasi-particles, excitons and polarons, uh, respond to light. So we can uh, interrogate them with light and discover and find out you know, some basic properties. And of course, but for, for, for device applications, um, it's the transport properties which are, are most important. But I'll talk mostly about the fundamental spectroscopic response of these uh, various particles. And I want to give a little shout out before I begin to a fabulous, fantastic student that I was very lucky to get, Raja Ghosh, who is um, responsible uh, for almost all the Polaron work you're going to see today. Uh, he's currently at the University of San Diego doing uh, work with uh, Francesco Pisani. But um, so anyway, I just wanted to alert, alert you to a fantastic student. So, uh, so specifically what I want to talk about today is, again, excitons and polarons. But for excitons, there's a UV visible response. So you see here, this is a spectra for a very uh, common polymer, popular polymer used in uh, various uh, organic materials devices called polythiophene, which you see here in the, in the figure. This is the UV vis response. So it's a very strong response. And they're due to excitons, the creation of these neutral excited states which in the single molecule is just an excitation, like S0, S1 excitation. Uh, but in an aggregate uh, or in a polymer, this moves around and gives a very uh, different response. Um, and of, of course, as I alluded to earlier, you have also the possibility of whole excitations. All right, and these, these have a mid-IR response. So I'm gonna talk about these two particles and their respective uh, spectral signatures in today's talk. And so just a little bit, before we begin, this is a slide I gave last time. Uh, where am I right now? Well, you can't see me on the map, but I'm right about here, uh, Philadelphia, right outside Philadelphia, a little bit northeast uh, is where I am right now in my back porch. And um, I, as, uh, as uh, JD told you, I'm from Temple University, which is a old university by US standards, but it's pretty brand spanking new by most uh, other standards. Uh, it's a research one university, which means they're in a top tier of research and uh, it's fairly large, 40,000 or so students. So uh, as I alluded to earlier, you know, these things are important because of their uh, commercial applications. Let's face it, we have uh, LG OLED TVs now, OLED, organic light emitting diodes. And these are displays, TVs, right, where the fundamental, you know, lighting mechanism derives from these uh, these excitons and and uh, their uh, emission. Okay, so uh, what I'm showing here, though, is not a light emitting diode, but an organic photovoltaic. So basically, uh, it's a solar cell. So I just want to give you an appreciation for why these particles are so important. So what you what you normally do is you excite this blue phase. This is the polymer that I showed you in the first slide. Um, and you excite this exciton. Again, it's neutral. So we talk about the excited electron as being the negative, the electron. And the uh, hole left behind is a positive charge. So these are bound electron hole states. Uh, so they're excitons and they move around because they're mobile because there's coupling between the various polymer units and along the chain. Eventually they find this interface here to a uh, C60 or a 
any kind of acceptor where there is electron transfer. And then when that happens, when the, uh, when the C60 you know, obtains this electron, you leave behind the hole, the bare hole on the polymer. And so you see in, this, in the uh, operation of this device, you already have excitons and polarons. And of course, these uh, charges then will go to their respective um, electrodes and generate a voltage. So uh, we're very interested in learning about uh, the uh, nature of these uh, quasi-particles, and that's where spectroscopy comes in, okay? And so um, I'm gonna give you a very uh, simple picture. Um, I'm a very simple-minded person in the end. I think very, very simply about things and try to derive the basic essentials before getting into the, uh, into the more complex details. But basically we have, uh, as I said, uh, excitons. We have these little gray circles, which are units, chromophores if you want. The red star means this particular chromophore is excited. And again, it's an electron hole pair. Um, these units can be non-covalently bound, like for example, pi stacks of perylene diamonds. There's many, many examples of pi stacks in the literature and they're also find their way into commercial applications. Um, but the model is much more general. It could also treat a single polymer, okay? So a single polymer is a bunch of repeat units. In this case, uh, a string of thiophene units. And you can imagine the exciton or the electron hole pair being confined to this particular unit here and then traveling up and down the chain. Um, a hole, on the other hand, is exactly, uh, as I said earlier, it's a positive charge. So after you oxidize this chain, and there's several ways you can do it, um, you leave behind a, uh, this particular unit, a, a hole, a radical hole, okay, half filled homo level. And like an exciton, you can have holes in pi stacks or non-covalently bound systems and holes in polymers, right? Um, so one of the um, interesting things about uh, electric uh, these uh, particles is, hold on a second. Uh, I'm just trying to get more room on my slides here. Uh, okay, so um, excitons, and again, I, I, I'm just gonna say very basic properties. They're created almost all the time. How do you get an exciton? Well, you have a ground state, uh, you know, a chromophore or an aggregate, and you excite it, you pump it with light, you create the exciton. That's kind of obvious, right? Um, but holes are, are a little bit more interesting because there are several ways you can create a hole, right? You could excite it optically and where you're gonna say, what would happen in that case, so photo-induced uh, absorption. So you excite the exciton and then it dissociates and it gives you a hole and an, and an electron, a positive and negative charge. Um, but more commonly, you can do it via charge injection. So you can set up a voltage across your polymer or your aggregate and inject holes which means you're sucking out electrons, or probably the most common way of doing it is to chemically dope the sample where you put in a strong electron acceptor, like we saw the fullerene in a couple of slides ago. Um, it could be iodine, that's the historically, you know, that's the one where Heger and McDermott and Shirakawa got the Nobel Prize when they doped polyacetylene with iodine, it sucked an electron away, and the resultant hole is conductive, right? And so holes are a little bit more uh, interesting in that respect. And because they're charged, they, uh, and unlike excitons, you can bind holes, you can localize them uh, by, uh, by just simply the presence of this dopant anion, right? So it makes like a kind of a strange one-dimensional anti-hydrogen type of atom if you want. And uh, so you have that extra uh, degree of freedom in controlling the localization of a hole by, for example, changing the size of the dopant anion, thereby changing the distance that the dopant uh, is from the chain. So um, again, what we're interested in right. ultimately, right. yeah. Quick question. Sure. Okay, so um, I, typically the, the, the literature is replete of uh, description of the whole polaron. Uh, right. But it's very hard to find experimental signatures of the the, the electron <laughs> yeah. polaron. And yeah. Um, yeah. This is, uh, maybe we will revisit this question at the end of the colloquium. It might be a better way to think about it. But um, but most of the time, uh, it's very hard to stabilize a electron polaron and you know look at it. Do you have a good reason as to? Uh, you know, uh, you know, just nothing more than kind of stating the obvious here, which is that electron affinities are not usually high enough in uh, these uh, systems and conjugated polymers to really 
cause a significant energy advantage for, for creating electron holes. So that's a huge, as you know, that's a huge area. Uh, acceptor, you know, non-fullerene acceptors, things that really have high electron affinities that will that will create uh, that will bind uh, negative uh, charges. Or, or, but you're right; it's uh, exactly the, the correct word there. Uh, the the, the uh, literature is dominated by um, you know whole polarons uh, in conjugated polymers, but very you know relatively. Yeah, it's, it's almost synonymous that polarons come and into mind, and you have a hole in. In, in the in the you know you, you think about it as the whole so most of the time um, right. when, we, when we talk about polarons it's almost you are automatically you're switched on to it must be a hole right we must be describing a hole at it's this almost point, right? always a hole 99 95 percent although right. recent, some recent papers especially in some pdi systems these paralene diamonds have pretty good electron affinities and they're good, pretty good acceptors and you can get some n type which is the electron right. type, uh, stuff right but you're exactly right yeah. So uh, yeah. So um, again, uh, transport, of course, is the ultimate goal here, and there are many things. This is a whole gigantic theoretical endeavor in itself. Is to understand, uh, you know, the efficiency and the uh, speed at which uh, charges or excitons are transported. And there's some obvious factors which affect this process. One is, of course, the electronic coupling between the individual chromophoric units. The second is the presence of vibrations, right? Because these things, uh, organic systems are considered soft in a sense that the, uh, the uh, excitation, electronic excitation is usually accompanied by significant nuclear relaxation. There's thermal fluctuations. There's just all kinds of disorder. There's a whole zoo of possibilities of, with, of disorder, intramolecular, intramolecular, stacking faults, dislocate, I mean, uh, torsional twists. I mean, it's, it's amazingly complex. Uh, morphology uh, in these systems. So all of that affects how quickly you transport charges, right? And as I said earlier, what we're interested in is what we can say or what we can understand or learn about these systems from spectroscopy. And in particular, uh, as I focused on in my, my talks in November, it's vibronic signatures that I think are uh, very informative. And so I always show this little little picture here. Um, the effect of vibronic coupling um, is huge on transport. And you can think of a bowling ball on a hard alley surface. Hard alley surface means you can consider it as a system of very, very stiff springs. And so the springs are hardly compressed and the ball flies down the alley, right? But if you put, that's more like a, an exciton or an energy or a particle in an inorganic system. Organic systems are very soft. So the metaphor is better, a better metaphor is a bowling ball on a mattress where now it interacts very strongly, the ball with the springs, they compress significantly underneath. And therefore it shares, the kinetic energy is, is shared with the potential energy. So it has to move slower, right? To conserve energy. And so we all know that if you try to roll a bowling ball on a mattress, they're gonna see a dramatic decrease in its velocity. So you really need to, to include it at, at the earliest phase. And that's what we do. We include it on equal footing with electronic coupling. So we, that has to be reflected in the Hamiltonian. We don't relegate it to a, a spectral density or anything like that, which is very, very common. So uh, where does this vibronic coupling come from in organic molecules? Well, in conjugated systems, which is the focus of today's talk, it's almost always uh, there. And what I'm showing you is two different, very different more, you know, topologies here. We have a polyene or carotenoid. We have a, a tetraazo terylene. Um, very different, but what they have in common is an alternating system of single and double bonds, so-called Pige conjugated systems. And you can see very well, very pronounced and beautiful vibronic progressions here. And these progressions are reflective of this vibronic coupling and they're, they're giving us information about the energy of this coupling, which is about 0.17 EV for this polyene. But surprisingly, despite the very different structure of this tetraazo uh, uh, terylene, the uh, vibronic progression is very similar. The energies are similar um, and the uh, relative intensities are similar. And so uh, we have kind of harped on this in our, uh, in our research and we, we consider this to be a reporter mode because these are individual molecules and the, and the question is what happens when you put them together in an aggregate if you observe or look at how this progression is distorted for an exciton that is, then you can say, something about the nature of the coupling or something about the exciton. So uh, the 
simple model is just this harmonica, you know, well. So you have a ground electronic state, which has its, uh, you know, harmonic well corresponding to a, this, usually it's a quinoidal or an aromatic quinoidal mode, the one I just showed you. Um, and then when you excite it, there's a uh, shift in the excited state potential. So if you do a vertical excitation this way, and then it relaxes, you can just measure this distance here. That's an energy, that's a relaxation energy. And you divide that by the fundamental vibronic quantum, you get a energy divided by energy, you get a dimensionless number called the Huang Reese factor, which is a measure of that shift, measure the relaxation energy. And so um, uh, knowing that Huang Reese factor, you can then predict the uh, vibronic progression and especially the relative intensities through the Frank Condon factors. The Frank Condon factors have the Huang Reese factor lambda in, inside them. So you can predict these vibronic progressions very readily. Now um, let's go back to our, um, our model of excitons and polarons in, in these uh, systems. And for the exciton now, I'm gonna be a little bit more specific. We're again, looking at this uh, as a system of, of chromophores, right? Uh, each chromophore has a homo and a lumo. And so in its ground state, they're doubly filled. The homo is doubly filled and lumo is empty. But in an exciton, you have a homo-lumo transition. So you have a homo half filled and a lumo half filled, right? So here's an exciton. And that exciton can move up and down the chain with a, a couple electronic coupling strength, okay? And electronic strapling, coupling strength for excitons, as I said in my last talk, I spent a long time discussing this, but it, it's basically coulombic, uh, a la kasha, and we'll talk about Kasha's model. Um, but it also has a, uh, a possibility of wave function overlap or charge transfer mediated couplings. So it's, it's quite complex, but for the, this talk, we're just gonna call it JEX. Um, a hole or a polaron uh, is very similar, except that you don't need LUMOs at all. Uh, first of all, you can just uh, consider a system of coupled HOMO levels, one for each chromophore in this, in this linear aggregate or this ball of polymer. And uh, the one that has the hole excitation is just simply half filled. So it's the lack of an electron or a hole, right? And the hole can move up and down the chain, just like the electron. And we call its electronic coupling T sub hole, okay? And now both of these particles, both electrons and holes, are subject to this same aromatic quinoidal stretch. So they both are, the transport of both of these particles is impeded or limited by the same vibrational mode. This is the same mode. And so we can look at, in each unit, we can describe as a ground and excited state. The ground state is a doubly filled HOMO. Now for the excited state, it has two possibilities. It could either be neutral, or electronic, or it could be a hole. And each one of those is represented by an excited state well, which is shifted. Now the shift will depend on whether it's an electron or a hole, but the basic structure is identical. Okay, so you can have a lambda squared for a hole and a lambda squared for an electron, but they're usually for P3HT, they're on the order of unity. Um, it's always bigger in the exciton than the hole. Um, and uh, the, again, the vibrational frequency, which corresponds to this aromatic nodal stretch is about 0 0.17, 0 0.18 uh, wave numbers, which is 1400 wave, I'm sorry, EVs, which is about 1400 wave numbers. Okay, so this is the model that we're going to, uh, to study and uh, try to get some unifying features. What are the differences? What are the similarities of excitons and polarons? Okay, so let's just show some examples. This is a um, the polymer P3HT. Now, when you make uh, these films, you spin cast films. Of course, it depends on the solvent that you use. And as you see here, there are two different prep. One is a spin cast film and one is a film prepared uh, very slowly, very carefully, slowly cooled and toluene. So there are different morphologies result. And the morphology is reflective of the order of the semi-crystalline domains. And you can see here that the photoluminescence and the absorption have very different relative vibronic intensities. And those differences are reflective of the electronic couplings that exist between these chains in these two different morphologies. And this term H-like and J-like, that means H aggregate and J, I'll describe that a little bit more later. I just wanted to show you that the signatures of, uh, the, um, of excitons in these systems are these UV vis vibronic regressions, which are sensitive to the morphology and even more sensitive to the, the electronic couplings. And again, we have, if you look at the distance between these two features, it's 0.174, exactly this aromatic conoidal energy I've been stressing. 
What about holes? Now holes I'm gonna spend a lot more time on than excitons because they're much more, uh, well, just, just because I spent so much time last time talking about exon, but, but what's a hole? Okay, so what's the spectral signatures? So here's a uh, mid IR now, okay, much lower energy. And you can see two different uh, P3HTs here, a blue and a red. The red is very ordered. It's called regio regular. Uh, and so these are the crystal, very uh, much more ordered ones. Whereas the blue one is a regio random. Okay, I won't say chemically what the difference is. It's, it's the placement of this, uh, uh, this uh, alkyl chain uh, in a regular or irregular fashion. But just for us, it's just important to know that for the regio random, they're very disordered. And you can see that the morphology has also a huge impact, even larger so in, in some sense than the exciton uh, model uh, example I just showed. Um, but you, you don't see a clear vibronic progression, certainly not in the disordered one, but you do see some important peaks. And you have this uh, famous peak called the P1 peak for a polaron. And then this, uh, this other peak, which is higher in this case in intensity, uh, which is called DP, uh, which is delocalized polaron. And let me just show you how conventionally we understand, especially P1. Now, P1 comes from the famous, you know, uh, Polaron model that goes back to the early 80s, back to the Heger and Woodle and uh, uh, Rada. And uh, basically um, what you find is that once you create this, this positive charge in a polymer chain, the chain relaxes and in kind of an adiabatic fashion, it creates these mid-gap states. So you have a uh, state that kind of peels away from the valence band and another state which peels away from the conduction band. And these mid-gap states are or uh, you know, dictate the mid IR absorption. So this P1 here, which is very different depending on morphology, comes from this traditionally or conventionally, this is how it comes in from this transition here. There's also a P2, which is much higher in energy and I'm not showing that region, that's a near IR peak and I'm not gonna talk about that. I'm just talking about this P1 peak. Now, what is DP1? Now DP1 goes back, not about 20 years, I guess now, and a very, very important paper, a science paper by Vardani, uh, Osterbacher and Vardani, which showed or, or uh, provided evidence that DP1, because it is corresponds to these very ordered systems, is due to interchain interactions. And they came up with a model. You can actually adjust this conventional model uh, by allowing interactions between two chains and splitting and come up with a decent explanation for DP1. Now, I should have mentioned that this experiment here done by Common uh, et al is a photo-induced polaron. There is no anion in here. So you, you might think that the polaron in this case has the greatest freedom to, to roam, to, 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 to uh, most delocalized, let's say. Now, if we add in a dopant, in this case, the very popular dopant F4 TCNQ, okay, which is a very strong electron acceptor, it will oxidize the chain and create a hole that way. You don't have to optically create it. And you see a very different spectrum. It kind of resembles the <clears throat> regio random spectrum. And <clears throat> there's every reason to think that because of this um, anion that the hole is gonna be limited in its localization. It's gonna be bound in some sense to this anion. And we get these two peaks. I'm just gonna call them A and B. Instead of using this convention DP1 and P1, we call them A and B. Okay, so there's some, some uh, idea that localization causes these, these, these very uh, dramatic changes in the spectrum. Let me show you even more so. Here's again, this uh, repeated spectrum I just showed you from common. So now let's just focus on this red here. So you see this very large A peak, very red shifted B peak. Also, what I show here is a single vibrational quantum. Remember, we're looking for vibronic signatures, right? And so let's look at that. Now let's See what happens as did uh, Ben Schwartz's group when we add a dopant, but a very large dopant. This is called dodecaborane, this, this tiny little central uh, anion, but it's got surrounded by this alkyl kind of shell. Um, and it's such a large anion, the shell is, relative, is, is, is quite large and therefore prevents the uh, uh, electro, the hole and the dopant from getting too close. So it kind of shields the uh, hole from the electron in the center. And in that case, uh, we wouldn't expect it to be too strongly bound, the hole, to this uh, electron, because again, this, this uh, steric uh, distance that's maintained. 
But what we do see is that the spectrum changes, right? And it changes in a uh, kind of an interesting way. The peak A goes down compared to a completely delocalized. And if you look carefully, it shifts closer to this dash line, which is one aromatic conoidal vibronic quantum, this 0.174 I've been talking about. Now, if you go further and use a smaller dopant, like we showed earlier, then the, um, the converge, you see A is even smaller now, and it's shifted even closer to a vibronic quantum. So we were looking at this for a long time, and believe me, it took us, you know, it's, it wasn't at all obvious in the beginning. And so we came up with this idea that, you know, our hypothesis was that <coughs> the vibronic signatures are a reflective of this uh, whole localization. So as peak A blue shifts towards a vibrational quantum and diminishes in intensity as the hole is localized. So we wanna try to drive that in because that's the, that's the signature. It's not nearly as obvious as a distorted vibronic progression that you saw for the exciton. So exitons and holes, very different uh, uh, vibronic signatures. So here's the uh, unifying Frank, Hamiltonian. Frank, yeah. Frank, um, um, two questions and a question by me, but first let me take the chat questions. Um, uh, Arya Nachiketa is asking, exciton need not necessarily be a positive and a negative charge pair, correct? That's the question. Uh, well, it pretty much, there's two general types of excitons. One is the Frankel exciton, which we're talking about here, where you can consider the electron hole bound to one unit of the Frankel core, like we've shown. Um, also, there's the Vanier type exciton, which is more uh, common in inorganic materials, but you can still see them in organic and just basically, in that case, the electron and hole are separated between chromophores. So the electrons on one unit, the holes on the other unit, and that might be what you're thinking about. Um, in this talk, we're going to, I'm, I'm going to be more general. I'm not going to get into the nitty gritty, but the, we can generalize the Hamiltonian that I'm going to show you in the next slide to include the separation of the exciton into a bound electron hole pair where the electron and hole are on different chromophores. But what we're gonna stay with today to make it a little bit more digestible is keeping the electron hole on the same chromophore unit. Right, okay. So I think that's right. where you were that's going with that. Answer. Yeah, the second question is uh, by uh, Professor Sanjay Vatagaonkar. Uh, he's asking why there is a sharp dip in the absorption at the dashed line. As a funny, okay. <clears throat> so if you look at the position of that dip, it looks very close to a vibrational quantum. And so we were going crazy for about a year, me and Raja. We thought the dip was, the, you know, the dip at a vibrational quantum was the signature. We didn't realize that the peak that was approaching the, you know, the vibrational quantum. Now that dip is, uh, well, it's partially due to, well, you're going to see that we can reproduce to some extent the dip. And I'll show you the model, uh, you're, you know, in a couple of slides. It's basically due to Hertzberg-Teller coupling. Um, but there could be other mechanisms due to uh, what they call IRAPs. And actually, it's good you, you asked me that because you notice these very sharp features. These are very reproducible. These are um, infrared active vibrational modes, and they're, they're basically superimposed on this Polaron uh, peak that I'm going to devote this talk, that I'm, that I'm going to discuss. I'm not going to consider these sharp resonances. And one of those sharp resonances, as you can see, Actually, they're called anti-resonance because they point downward in these ordered samples. And if you want to uh, understand more about these superposed features, uh, you can read about, uh, you can, Vardani has a whole discussion about them. Um, but I am going to just kind of look at the average shape here. So I'm going to ignore that um, because basically these features are kind of, uh, they, I, I think of it, 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 it's kind of superimposed on this much broader feature. Okay, so I'm going to focus on this broader A band. Okay, and not, I hope that was uh, an answer. Sanjay, Sanjay, you are here. Sanjay? Yeah, can I, can I just ask something more? So, so basically, if I understand correctly, these are the mid gap states which are causing this absorption in the, this region of the infrared, right? And mm -hmm. in that, in the band A, you have sharp vibrational resonances or vibronic features, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so, so um, these two states are so uh, decoupled from each other that the loss of so almost 100% transmission somewhere around this omega vibrational line dashed line. Is that is that a correct interpretation? Uh, 
the dash line is exactly one vibrational quantum. I just want to, I should have said, and I don't know if I'm going to uh, start a little bit of a debate here, but I don't believe in, uh, I can't, I don't believe in the mid gap interpretation of polarons. And I'm going to show you a new interpretation, which will clarify exactly why we see this behavior. And why don't I believe in mid gap states? Because the nuclei, this aromatic conoidal mode is moving too fast. Um, the mid gap states are, are, would be appropriate if the nuclei were moving very slow to make a Bornheimer, and that's what they do. They use a Bornheimer, they map out these potential surfaces. Um, however, um, I think uh, it's not correct. And I also know that, uh, I don't think I'm alone in this. There's uh, important experiments by Norbert Koch, for example, which shows that um, the ionization potentials don't match. If you have a mid-gap state, it has, should have a smaller ionization potential. If you compare it to first and second ionization potentials, they don't agree with the mid-gap uh, uh, conventional theory. So I'm going to propose a new theory for polarons. Okay, so okay. keep that in mind. <laughs> Thank uh, you. We'll go a little further now. So here's my new theory, all right? So it's very simple. It's kind of a cruder theory because I'm using... Uh, you know, I'm, it's kind of coarse grained. Each unit, you know, for example, in P3HT is a thiophene unit, right? And so it's a homo and lumo of that whole unit, not, it doesn't have atomistic detail, but in any event, it has enough to describe what I just showed you. So uh, it's a Holstein Hamiltonian. So you have uh, for both excitons and polarons exactly the same Hamiltonian. Of course, you'll have different, param you know, parameterized a little bit differently. You have a, except, uh, you have a, energy. Now, of course, omega zero zero would be the S naught S one transition energy for excitons. But when you create a hole from a full ground state, it's the ionization energy. And BMN is the electronic coupling uh, for excitons. It's this JEX we've been talking about. And I'll assume the simplest model, just nearest neighbor coupling. Uh, whereas for polarons, it's the TH, right? And another thing about this Hamiltonian, which is very important, these, these bra kets, these are M and N, these states N and M, for the exciton, the N state means the nth chromophore is excited with a homolumo transition, right? But if you wanna use this Hamiltonian for polarons, then the nth state corresponds to a positive charge or a hole on the nth, right? It's very kind of straightforward. Um, both of the excitons and holes are coupled, as I said, to this by the same mode. So for both systems, omega vibe is exactly the same. It's the aromatic conoidal stretching mode. Uh, the HR factor may differ, will differ a little bit because the shifts will be different for excitons and polarons, but in both cases on the order of one. So I'm gonna use this Hamiltonian then to compare and contrast excitons and polarons. And I should say, I also have, so, okay. So if I'm going a little too fast, this is the basically counts the number of vibrational quanta. So this is a vibrational term. This is your displacement. When you excite the nth molecule, you move the uh, uh, harmonic well over. So this is your local exciton phonon coupling. And then this, I just added at the end, it's very important, but I just don't have enough time to go really into it. This is disorder. We talked about how uh, the, the morphology is so complex. You have to have a, some attempt to understand that. And this is just site energy fluctuations. It's a site disorder. Okay. so. Um, if you go way back to 1971, uh, I was just 10 years old. So I didn't look at that paper when I was 10, I was much older, but I went back and this was a real revelation for me. This was a paper by Michael Philpott, who's still active, I believe. Um, anyway, um, if you looked at that, that Hamiltonian looks a little bit simple, but it has a very, it's not so simple to uh, work with. Um, Lots of papers have been dedicated to the Holstein Hamiltonian, but I'll just say that we can approach near exact solutions by using this so-called two particle basis set. So we, maybe the easiest way to describe the basis set, which has both electrons and vibrational excitations, right? Because it has both particles, both vibrations and electrons or electronic excitations in it, be it an exciton or a polaron, we need to expand it to include these vibrations. So. We, we talked earlier about just having the end state, that's a pure electronic state, either a polaron or exciton. Now we've got a couple in these vibrations. So there's one particle states and two particle states. Let me show you pictures. Here's an exciton demonstration of a one particle state. So the nth molecule has two vibrational quanta in its excited state. So the nth molecule is electronically excited 
with two quanta of vibration in the excited state. So that's a one particle state. Why do we call it one? Because all the other molecules are both electronically and vibrationally in the ground states. Only one particle is lit up. If you look at a two particle state, it's a vibronic vibrational pair. So here you can see the nth molecule N is excited vibronically, so electronically and vibrationally. Whereas the uh, downfield, in this case, N plus two, could be N plus one, I just made it N plus two, we have a purely vibrational excitation, you see? So we're up here with a single quantum state. The ground state has no quantum. And so it's a vibronic vibrational state, and this is how we designate it. Now, you can imagine the basis set increasing to three particle, four particle states. Again, it's two particle because it's an electronic. So two molecules in the batch are excited, one vibronically, one vibration. So we call it a two particle state. So you can imagine one electronic, two vibrational. That would be a three particle state or a four particle or a five particle. It just so happens that in the phase space that defines organic materials, you can get away with one and two particles as a good approximation for what's happening. Now that's excitons, here's polarons. Polaron again is got the same type of electronic designation except it indicates a hole and we use the same vibrational excitation. It's only, the only difference is now the excited state is, is a cation, right? So you go from neutral to cation when you excite with an ionizing photon, right? So um, we, it's exactly, exactly maps, you know, the same type of multi-particle basis set is used for either particle. So now let's let's look at the simpler case. Let's now take away vibrations. And what happens if you just have electronic coupling? So you have a Hamiltonian, which is much simpler than the Holstein. Now this is called the, the Frankel Hamiltonian, if you're talking about excitons. But the only difference between excitons and phonons, remember N is, is it, it's either an electronic or a whole excitation. And so the couplings are either JEX or TH, and they can move up and down. This is a one dimensional chain, right? So if you solve this, this is just like particle in the box. If J or TH is negative, then the state, just like a particle in a box with lowest energy has no nodes. As you increase in energy, you increase the number of nodes until you get to the highest energy state, which has maximal number of nodes. Uh, the node here is K minus one. So in the ground state, you have no nodes in the excited state, you have N minus one nodes. N is the number of chromophores, right? So in this case, it'd be one, two, three, I think there's 10. Okay, so you have these excited states, which are just like particle in a box. So if you know particle in a box, you know this Hamiltonian. Now, if I flip the sign, well, before I flip the sign, let me just give you the eigenstates. The eigenstates are just delocalized excitons, and I don't use periodic boundary conditions, so this is what they are. Again, if K is one, you can understand this is just like the top part of a sine wave, okay, so no nodes. Um, the energies, again, depend on whether it's JEX or TH, but very simple dispersion. This dispersion, this bandwidth, is roughly four times the electronic nearest neighbor coupling. Now, if I flip the sign, all it does is flip the ordering of the states. So now the states with no nodes is on top and the states with many nodes is on the bottom. Okay, so what does this mean for excitons and what does it mean for polarons? Now, very important here. It's very simple too. Um, as I said earlier, to create an exciton, we have to excite from the ground state with no excitons. Okay, so we come in with a neutral polymer or a neutral aggregate, you know, and we come in with light. We have to excite it. We almost always excite it optically because this gap here is usually UV vit. Okay, and so we have a transition diode. It says kill a ground state, create an excited state. So you go from no excitons to one exciton. But which exciton do you excite? Well, you excite the one with no nodes because the wavelength of light is usually much bigger than an aggregate. So the electric fields are in phase. So it excites the molecules in phase. And so you see a big absorption in this case where we have a positive coupling, we see absorption to the top of the band. Okay, so um, this is the idea for excitons and it only goes, the absorption only goes to the K equal one state, right? Or dominated by the K equal one state, all right? So that's a, so you're going from no excitons to this band of one excitons and in particular, the state with no nodes. Now for polarons, it's very interesting, right? It's very different. So we're assuming we already have a hole. Why is that? Well, if we dope a polymer or dope an aggregate, 
we have already taken the electron out. Okay, and so what is the ground state? It already is the lowest eigenstate of that Holstein Hamiltonian I showed you. So the ground state is part of the eigenbasis of the Hamiltonian and it's the lowest energy state. Okay, so we're going from a state which already has one polaron to a state which is also one polaron. All right, and now the dipole moment operator looks very different. This looks like if you did like particle in a box, this would be like N would be like X. It's basically uh, the dipole moment. And it gives you transitions that are only connected by delta K equal one. Okay, so if you start here, this is the state with all the nodes. So it's N, you go to N minus one. Okay, so polar ion absorption understood that we're starting from a ground state with one polar ion which is the lowest excited state. We have our own. So basically they differ in the ground states and in the form of the dipole moments, okay? So now let's see what happens when we change this, you know, how, how does the spectrum react to the sign? Whoops, I don't know what I just did there. Oh, okay, I don't know. Uh, so let's start with negative sign. So I just told you when, neg when J is negative, it's like a regular particle in a box. Here's the state with, all, with no nodes and so, uh, if you look at the single molecule or single chromophore absorption, it's in the middle of the band. So there's a redshift here. So in a J aggregate, which is corresponds to a negative coupling, we have a redshift relative to the monomer in the absorption spectrum. Whereas if we change the sign to positive, we have an H aggregate because now the K equal one state goes to the top. And we have a blue shift. And so this is known as the, uh, the Kasha spectral signatures, right? You have a monomer. If your aggregate blue shifts, you have, you call that an H aggregate, it corresponds to positive coupling. And if it redshifts, it is reflective of a negative coupling. Now that's the exciton, right? Let's see what happens if we have a polaron. Now a polaron again, I, I just told you, it starts from, in the case here with no disorder or anything, K equal one, right? Goes to K equal two. This is the state where TH is negative. No nodes, one node, just delta K equal one. A very simple selection rule, but look how small the energy difference is, right? If I switch the sign, this is very interesting. We flip the order from N, now the state on the bottom, the ground state has N nodes, and it's first, it's excited to the state with N minus one nodes. The energy is exactly the same. And in fact, if you look at the transition dipole moment squared, which is related to the oscillator strength, it's exactly the same. In other words, there is no effect of sign on the polar on absorption spectrum. It's very small and because of this, this little tiny difference here, it's mid IR and it's completely insensitive to the sign. There are no J or H polarons. There are J or H excitons, polarons don't care. Sign doesn't matter for polarons, sign matters for excitons. So let's shift, let's discuss excitons a little bit. I mentioned Kasha. Kasha went beyond what I just said. He associated, he knew that positive and negative couplings would, would induce blue and red shifts. But what Kasha, his huge contribution was showing that, well, positive couplings are due to a side-by-side -side morphology where negative couplings are due to a head-to-tail morphology. And why is that? Think of just two couple dipoles that are parallel and side-by-side. -side. You're gonna, if you look at the dipole-dipole coupling, it's positive, right? And so you get a blue shift is, is reflective of a positive sign, but also reflective of a side-by-side -side morphology. And many people use blue shifts to, to then infer what the packing is in an aggregate. Maybe you have a solution aggregate, you don't have available x-ray, so you do that. And I really worry about that. I think there are, um, I said, well, let me continue. Whereas if you have a, a red shift, it's a negative coupling, it's usually a head to tail. But why I worry about it is because there are other things besides excitonic shifts or excitonic couplings, which give spectral shifts. So you can be in trouble if you adhere to this uh, kind of Kasha uh, prescription without really thinking about what the nature of those shifts are. Um, but there are still many examples which uh, are in agreement with Kasha. Uh, we have the famous example of pseudoisocyanine chloride, uh, the first real J aggregate, why do they call it J? Because this was discovered in the 1930s, this aggregate by somebody called Jelly, but also somebody called Shiva. So it just turned out that J went to, you know, the name went to Jelly. It's not an S aggregate, it's a J aggregate. It's just the way history is, right? 
Uh, but what you see is in the monomer spectrum, again, that beautiful vibronic progression reflective of what? The quinoidal aromatic mode, same one. Look at this difference here. It's about 0.17 EV. And when you aggregate it, how do you aggregate? You can change a pH or lower the temperature, whatever. And you make this very strong redshifted J band. So redshift J aggregate. And many people say, oh, it's head to tail, brick-like structure because of this redshift. Then you have an H aggregate. This is dystyrobenzene where they do pack side by side. We know from the crystal structure, um, the monomer again, beautiful vibronic structure, very similar energy, same vibrational mode. Now it shifts very strongly to the blue, which is reflective of the side-by-side -side packing in a herring bone. Um, you see uh, lots of vibronic structure in the aggregate too. And so, as I said, spectral shifts come from exciton coupling, but they can arise from other sources. So you got to be careful. There's also gas to crystal shifts, which are almost always red shifts. Uh, so you can't confuse those with, with excitonic couplings from head to tail J aggregates, or if you get in trouble, uh, planarization of molecules when they form aggregates. So it's very, uh, could be, um, uh, uh, give you mis, you know, incorrect assignments. Exciton coupling is more reliable obtained from vibronic signatures. So let's go back now. Can I ask a question? Sure. Frank, um, the G aggregate spectrum is pretty sharp. But it also has another feature at around 515 nanometers. Um, if you were to see the ah, yeah, yeah, here. Oh, what is that due to? Do you have? Oh, is it very, a very good, excellent uh, observation there? Um, I think that it's uh, basically this is very strongly coupled. This could be evidence of the vibronic structure of the aggregate. Okay. But I know from my brief experimental days with Warren. So I have some, a little bit more experimental uh, insight than maybe your average theoretician. I worry that it's just leftover monomer as well. You gotta be yeah. really careful with yeah. this. Yeah, right? and the same, the same part of the question, I think Aru, uh, my student is asking, uh, the H aggregate spectrum in, in, on the right-hand side plot, the 25,000 wave number feature, again, is that sharp feature, which is beyond the monomer. It looks like a J. Uh, uh -huh. Uh, yeah, you have to go back to, to I, this is what I started with years ago. It's not a J-band. It's actually a uh, vibronic, uh, it's, it's due to Hertzberg-Teller coupling, actually, if you really want to know. The J-band, there is a J-band, by the way, because of the fact that the unit cell has, I, as again, I said it was herringbone and the slight misalignment of the dipole moments but it's very weak. These are not polarized spectra. So you would see maybe this little, I don't know if you could even see it. This little yeah. shoulder yeah. here is more likely than J-band. Okay. This, okay. But this Hertzberg teller coupling will be uh, important for what I'm gonna show you as well. Okay, and, and this one more question by um, Professor Shudipto Maiti. Shudipto? Yeah. Um, so I was wondering, looking at this, uh, Professor Spano, um, that, uh, you know, there are naturally occurring aggregates called amyloids, and they do have amino acids, uh, which are, uh, you know, aromatic amino acids, and they do come in a proper geometry. But I don't recall anybody reporting any, uh, the, you know, J or H aggregate kind of shift in that. Did you ever uh, look into this? Because, uh, yeah, you well, as I'll show you. There are tyrosines which are just lined up like that. So if I were a little choppy there, but what I will, I think I understood the gist of your question, which is um, you have an aggregate, but you don't really see necessarily a strong spectral shift. And as I'll show you in, actually, I'll give you an example of this, uh, where the vibronic signatures are clear, but the spectral shift is very minimal. So you may not even suspect aggregation based on the Kasha recipe. However, if you look at the vibronic distortions, you can easily say, oh, there's something going on. The electronic coupling has got to be there. So let me show you, I hope to show you an example of that. Okay, so let's now look at our uh, coupling. Uh, let's look at our uh, exciton now, but let's put in vibronic coupling and let's do it in a very weak way. And by weak, I mean the uh, exciton bandwidth here. Remember we said this is basically four times the excitonic coupling is much smaller than a vibronic quantum. So what we have then is a series of 
of vibronic bands. Each band is like a little particle in a box in this case. All right, so we start from the one node to the end nodes with zero quantum. We start here in the next higher energy vibronic band, one node to end nodes with one vibrational quantum. And then same continuing. Because this vibrational energy is bigger than the ex excitonic coupling. And so you can see then that what would happen to the J aggregate with vibrational coupling, you'll get a vibronic progression um, because you have excitation to, and, and a redshift, uh, because you're exciting to the K equal one state in each one of these vibronic bands. So it gives you a vibronic progression. If you go to an H aggregate, again, you get the same structure, except the important fact is now each band is flipped. So it's a particle in a box where the nodeless state is on top. And so each individual peak is a little bit blue shifted. Okay, but, um, and, but you still get a vibronic regression. What I wanna just alert you to, and this is similar to the question I was just asked, you might think that these blue shifts are very obvious, but sometimes uh, there's what, not sometimes, but what, you're, what you also have is a higher order interaction between like K states from different bands. So this K equal one state, this is just a zero order state, if you have a strong enough coupling, it'll interact with the K equal one state here and the K equal one state here by symmetry. And so that interaction causes a redistribution of oscillator strength and causing these various peaks to have different uh, relative intensities compared to a monomer. And that's the vibronic signatures that we're talking about. And that redistribution depends on whether you have a J aggregate or an H aggregate. Okay, so let's take a look um, at now the polaron. Now, again, we said that uh, when there is no vibrations, a polaron doesn't care about sign. So let's now look at what happens when we put vibrations. And again, in the weak coupling limit, we have bands that are, you know, ele electronic band, vibronic bands, which are separated by a vibrational quantum. And again, uh, remember the selection rule for polaron was delta K equal plus one. So we saw this earlier, this little very low energy transition. You could also have delta K equal plus one, so you're starting at K equal one, to K equal two in the band which has a single vibronic uh, quantum. You could also go from uh, the ground state to a state with, B, with K equal two in the state which has two quantum. So you, you should get something that also looks like a vibronic progression. But if you flip the sign, again, it has no, it should not have any effect. Of course, I'm gonna show you with this calculated spectrum, but we also anticipate that it's, it's not going to affect the progression. But what we find is um, a progression, which is very interesting because you saw in those earlier slides with P3HT, there was no evidence of a vibronic progression for a polaron. It's almost a little weird. So let's take a closer look now at a calculation. I'm gonna do some numerical solutions to that Holstein Hamiltonian. I'm gonna look at an exciton in the left here and a hole. Um, we're going to, maintain weak coupling. Uh, we're going to take a linear chain of 10 and we're going to take the normal vibronic quantum uh, vibration of uh, 0.180V. And here's what happens in a J aggregate. So I'm going to keep the coupling negative. I'm going to keep them equal to each other so it can more easily compare a polaron to an exciton. So um, negative couplings, here's the polaron as expected, much lower energy than the exciton because these are uh, kind of transitions within that band of particle in a box like states, so they're much lower. Um, you'll notice that I also show in dashed line here, a single monomer spectrum for the exciton. And what you see is uh, when you activate the coupling for an exciton, it's a J aggregate, so it's negative. You see that there is a redshift. Look at this peak versus the uh, peak for a monomer. Um, but more pronounced is a redistribution of oscillator strength. You see now the lowest energy vibronic quant uh, peak has much more intensity than the next highest one, whereas in the monomer, they were equal. Now let me flip the sign. We're going to flip the sign to make an H aggregate. And first we'll look at the exciton. You see that the redistribution is exactly opposite to what happened in the J aggregate. Now the first vibronic peak has less intensity compared to the second. But as that question was asked, you notice that the spectral shift, you can't even see it. But if you actually looked at this, there's a tiny blue shift of the aggregate versus the monomer. It's very, very small. But what's more interesting is the dramatic change in the vibronic structure. It's a very clear indication of an H aggregate. Whereas if you went with the blue shift, you may not even think you had an aggregate. 
Okay, so all I did was change the sign and going from the left to the right. Notice the polar on, nothing, exactly the same. So even in the presence of vibrations, sign doesn't matter for a polar on. Okay, so let me just go back to excitons and show you very quickly. If we start with a chromophore, which has a unitary Huang Reese factor, so that the first two peaks are equal intensity, and I just increase the coupling in a J, in a, sorry, in an H aggregate, you see that how the vibronic intensity to the first two peaks is redistributed. The ratio between the two peaks goes down as the coupling goes up, whereas in a J aggregate, the exact opposite, as you increase the coupling, but now it's negative, you see that the vibronic ratio increases. Notice that you also see a red shift, just like Kasha predicted for a J aggregate, and you see a blue shift for a H aggregate. When, you, when you're strong enough coupling, the, uh, the vibronic coupling is strong enough, or the electronic coupling is strong enough, I should say, you really reproduce accurately what Kasha was saying. So we can take this ratio, this 0, 0, 0, 0,001 ratio, we can do perturbation theory, we can get this expression here, and this is nice because if you look at the measured ratio, you can then pull out the, the actual excitonic coupling. So from the ratio, you get the coupling. And we've applied this many examples. If you look at my older talks, you can see lots more. I'm just gonna briefly say, so we've been talking about P3HD, again, in these two different, um, uh, here I have two different spin cast films uh, with different solvents, but basically you can see the ratios are different. And from those vibronic ratios, using the perturbation theory, I can pull out directly the excitonic coupling or the bandwidth, which is just four times the coupling. And you can see a dramatic change based on morphology. So we can really use these vibronic signatures for excitons in a very practical way. Let's go back to polarons because I'm almost done now. There's, this is the climax, right? So what about polarons? So I just re-showed you the same thing I showed you earlier. I just focus on this A transition. We go from a delocalized polaron, we see A is very large and red shifted. This dashed line is one vibrational quantum. As I localize with these different sized dopants, you can see peak A moving closer to a vibrational quantum and diminishing in intensity until in this very uh, intimately uh, related um, electron hole pair, or I should say dopant hole pair, you see uh, peak A really getting close uh, of course, you see also these IRABs, but the general um, peak A is closer to a vibrational quantum. And it's also very low in intensity. So that's the idea. PK blue shifts towards a vibration. This is the signature that I've been uh, selling. It, it moves toward vibrational quantum and diminishes as it's, as it's, and diminishes in intensity as it's localized. No vibronic progression. I just showed you a vibronic progression for both excitons and polarons. So is it wrong? What's going on? So here's again, there's the polaron. Why? Do, that's a clear vibronic progression, although a very strange one. The first peak is actually very low in an energy, um, but the other two peaks are vibronically, you know, are one vibration higher and then two vibrations higher. So why don't you see that? Here's the spectrum I showed you earlier. Uh, notice that I use TH as, uh, doesn't matter about sign, but it's 0.05 EV, which is significantly smaller than a vibrational quantum. So we can, we can appreciate this weak coupling regime. What I wanna show you though, is that for polymers that show this AB structure, the weak coupling is completely not ap applicable. You have to have much stronger. In fact, if you calculate TH for P3HT, it's almost an order of magnitude higher. Um, and so what happens when you increase T TH or almost more importantly, decrease N? So we know that if these are particle in a box like manifestations, if I decrease N, that's like decreasing L, making the box smaller. And what we'd expect is that the bands should get fatter further apart, just like carbon box. You decrease the L, you increase the energies. And so what happens when I either do that or both, either decrease, increase TH or decrease N? Let's look at these K equal one and K equal two, right? They are going to increase steadily as you decrease N or increase TH. And eventually they'll get so large, the separation between one and two, that they will exceed a vibrational quantum. You see, now I can put in the vibrational quantum. Now they're tucked in between K equal one and K two, exactly the opposite to what we saw earlier. And more so when I do this strong coupling limit defined by E2 minus E1, 
being much bigger than the vibrational quantum, the eigenstates tend toward these product states. These are kind of uh, adiabatic born Oppenheimer states where it's now you can look at them as products of these x k equal one exotons and any number zero, one, two of these phonon states. So that's a, more of a mathematical detail. But the important thing is what are the transitions now that you would expect in this case? And now you would see a possibly a transition to this lowest vibrational level. Of course, you would still see your B transition, which is your elect, mostly electronic transition between K equal one and K equal two, but you would also see this A. And it turns out that if you just included A and B and um, uh, included the A state to be, or treated the A state to be this one here, just this product state, you would have no intensity in A. What happens is, that with the right symmetry, by adjusting the symmetries of the excitons and phonons to be the same for this state as well as the B state, you can mix these states together and get what's known as Hertzberg Keller coupling. In other words, the A transition becomes allowed because it borrows or mixes with B. So A and B mix together. These two, what I should more accurately say is that these two zeroth order states mix together to redistribute oscillator strength amongst A and B. And so when you do that, I'm not gonna show you the details, you see that peak A actually approaches, the actual energy of peak A is omega vibe, right? Which we've been noticing, minus, so it's redshifted, it's approaching omega vibe. And this is just reflective of this perturbation theory. So it has in a denominator, this spectral difference between these two zeroth order energies, right? And of course, uh, depending, it must have a vibrational origin. So lambda squared uh, is, is is really the coupling uh, times omega vibe squared. So we see that peak A is really a Hertzberg-Teller coupling uh, due to Hertzberg-Teller coupling. Where peak B, if you look at this, uh, as we're going to predict this, um, as you localize, it should go to the dimer value, which is where k equal one and k equal two. There are only two states is just twice the whole. And you may not appreciate that, but I'll show you in the next slide why that's true. Now, can I justify this strong coupling picture of the Hertzberg-Keller coupling? Yeah, because in P3HT, if you do DFT calculations or whatever, it's really about 0.4 or even 0.5. So it's 10 times larger than what we've been looking at when we got these vibronic regressions. Um, and if you look at an N equal 10 chain and look at your E2 minus E1, it's 0.1 EV. It's actually a little bit smaller than a vibrational quantum, but if you go to a dimer, so if you localize, then your E2 minus E1 almost increases by an order of magnitude. So we think what we're seeing is localization in these um, relatively strongly coupled chains, which is responsible for those spectral signatures of P3HT. So let me show you um, some of our real calculations. So we took a chain of 10, Again, the same type of parameters. Now we're using a physically justified value of TH. We have N equal 10. We're moving the anion closer to the chain. And here are the calculated spectrum. As I move it closer, so the dotted line is the anion in infinitely away, no anion, no doping. Now, as I move it closer, you're seeing exactly what we predicted with Hertzberg Teller coupling. The peak A is initially redshifted, but it, the redshift diminishes as you get closer and as the ion moves closer and closer, and it starts to approach a vibrational quantum. At the same time, as you localize, peak B dramatically blue shifts. And if you look at where 2T is, remember T is 0.4, it's around 0.8. So you might say, why is it doing that? Uh, why is it localizing to a dimer and not to a monomer? Okay, so this is just basically a graph showing exactly what I just said, a blue shift as you decrease the anion distance, as you bind the polaron, as you localize the polaron, and a shift of A towards a single vibrational quantum. In other words, a strong coupling Hertzberg Teller. So what we're finding then is very, I just said it several times, but I'll just say again, peak A and B, both blue shift and narrow as you move the anion in, as you bind the polaron, both peaks, blue shift, right? But peak A converges toward omega vibe and peak B converges towards simply twice the whole energy. Now, why is it twice? So let me show you really what's happening as far as Coulomb binding goes. Here's the anion. I situated the anion right in the center of a chain of 10. That means it's right between 
the fifth and the sixth thiophene, which I'm calling one and two. If it's right in between, then the binding to the hole is exactly equal. As I increase, decrease this anion distance, I increase the, the Coulomb binding, right? So I lower the energy of those two central units so that they're much lower than the, the other units. And so what I'm doing is as I'm moving the, the anion closer, I'm isolating a pair of thiophene units, all right? Um, if I then include the hole coupling between those two pairs, I have effectively isolated a dimer from this chain of 10 by moving it very, very close, the anion very close to uh, one and two. Okay, so to show that, so I've calculated a 10 mer with very close anion, in this case, 0.2 nanometers from, from one and two, right, from the chain axis. And I also calculated a dimer with no anion. You can see the spectra are virtually identical. So the idea is correct. As you move in the anion, you localize onto a dimer. Okay, and if you look at the energy of peak B, it's very close to twice the whole energy, just what you'd expect for a dimer. And again, peak A is close to a vibrational quantum. So we're really in the Hertzberg-Teller regime here. Um, another way to kind of quantify the localization is let's, let's talk about the coherent number of, of biofine units or chromophore units in a polaron. And that's the shaded region here. As I move in the, the, the uh, dopant, the shaded region collapses to encompass just the, the uh, uh, chromophores one and two, right? So how can I quantify the number, the localization number of a polaron? I use a coherence function, okay? So the coherence function is basically giving you a function, the width of which is the number of units over which the polaron is behaving like a wave, it's coherence length, okay? So I show in this picture here, once you calculate this coherence length, you get this symmetric function. It's kind of like the, the width of the wave function, if you want. And as I, and I'm not gonna go into details, but as I localize, I narrow, okay? So basically the width of this is the coherence number. So what I'm saying is that the coherence number should converge towards two as I move in the anion. And so let's look at that spectrum again. I just repeated what I showed you earlier. And now if I map out, if I calculate the coherence number, you can see it drops towards two as we expect. Okay, so the, the, the presence of the anion is very important in binding or localizing the whole. And so we've also generalized our results to not just a single chain, but to a whole stack of chains. In this case, there's no anion. So you think that hole can go along the chain. It can delocalize in the between chains as well. So there's a coherence number for along the chain and a coherence number between chains. So I call that intra and interchain coherence numbers. And so we can look at this spectrum here. And you can see the dominant A peak uh, versus B. If I bring in an anion on this stack of chains, you can see the dramatic change in the spectrum, exactly like you saw in the real spectrum. Okay, um, and a diminishment here of the coherence numbers from five and almost three to actually, oh, I'm sorry, from three or a four to one and a half. Okay, so a dramatic decrease um, with because of the presence of a hole. And so we looked at um, a real experiments and this is from a 2016 paper, but we um, took our experimental um, spectra from Searinghaus paper, that's the one in solid black. This is for high molecular weight, low molecular weight. Without going into great detail, we were able to simulate it pretty closely with our model um, and pull out coherence lengths. This is a two-dimensional coherence function because I said you can, you can uh, define a number of coherently connected polarons either along the chain or between chains. You can pull out uh, coherent numbers, inter and intrachain coherent numbers. And so the, basically the product of those two is the total number of two-dimensionally bound, uh, or two-dimensionally um, uh, coherent or, or units which define the coherence number in 2D. It's about 16. We go into a uh, lower molecular weight which has more disorder according to Searinghouse and that beautifully reflects, is reflected in the calculations with a diminishment of coherence number from 16 to six. And finally, we looked at some of our uh, own measurements. I worked very closely, as I show you in the acknowledgments, 
with experimentalists, uh, Albert Saleo, Alberto Saleo at uh, Stanford, and with uh, Christine Luscombe at University of Washington, who made these uh, P3HT polymers. This is a very low molecular weight. Um, and you can see that our simulations are very accurate. They're blue dashed. Here we had to assume two different distributions of, of whole anion distances. And we believe that's reflected in two different forms of low molecular weight P3HT, form one and two. I won't go into that details, but I'm just showing you that the model is very useful um, in predicting in, in these vibronic structures and then pulling out important, important properties of the polaron, like the coherence number. So I just want to round out, I'm going to finish now. I think we're uh, a little bit tired now, but I want to end with a, uh, you know, kind of close the loop. And I talked about how uh, we can determine coherence properties of the polaron, right? The polaron ground state from its uh, absorption features, these A and B features. Uh, just to say that excitons, uh, the lowest state in the exciton manifold is exactly equivalent to the ground state of the polaron. So you might wonder, can I get information about the coherence of the lowest energy uh, exciton? The easiest way, and the most direct way is, is, is through luminescence because the lowest energy exciton will emit, right? If it's a J aggregate, it will emit very strong zero, zero, and also some zero, one, and zero, two. These are the same vibrations we've been talking about, right? And so just to make a long story short, um, the ratio now in the photoluminescence spectrum of an exciton emission spectrum is a direct measure of ENCO. So in the polaron, it was the A to B kind of ratio in the, in the absorption spectrum. In an exciton, it's kind of like the 0001 relation of the PL spectrum. I'm just showing you this. So um, I, as, it, as I said, to complete the loop, I'm not going into great detail. So as you localize an exciton, now you can see that localization in changes if this is a J aggregate in a 0001 ratio. So that kind of completes the story. You could also talk about H aggregates we had more time. Uh, here's some applications to petrocene using the photoluminescence now ratio uh, for an exciton as a indicator of coherence length. And we can pull out uh, the coherence as a function of temperature, in which case uh, it's not as large as you might think. It's on, on the order of you know, five or six, even at four Kelvin. So let me end now. Um, and so uh, basically I presented a, a unifying, hopefully you agree, uh, uh, approach model Hamiltonian to uh, describing both excitons and polarons um, in in organic materials, and um, it's very interesting because I have a common Hamiltonian. We can make all kinds of comparisons, and as I've done, I really didn't talk much about um, disorder. Um, but if you look at that uh, paper I just published with Raja Ghosh, you can see a lot more about how uh, polarons and excitons compare with respect to energy landscapes. But basically, I wanted to just drive home the fact that um, excitons show uh, vibronic signatures through distorted vibronic progressions, which we can interpret as J or H aggregates with a given amount of coupling, uh, whereas polarons uh, absorb in the mid IR and their signatures are related to this A and B peak ratio. Okay, um, we can use that ratio to back out the coherence number of, of the coherence length, so to speak, of a polaron. Um, so, um, yeah, so, uh, what's the future? And we're really excited about this. What we're actively doing now is, uh, I talked about a polaron as a, a bound, uh, whole, uh, do, um, and reduced open pair, right? We talked about the spectral signatures of this as a function of the distance between the X, the electron and the hole. What happens if I dope it strongly, if I increase the doping concentration, so I make more negatives. I'm going to then get in cases where I'll have bipolarons. I'll have, I'll have connections between these polarons, kind of making a very strange anti-hydrogen-like one-dimensional complex. And so we're looking now at what happens when we move these anions together to create bipolarons. This is a very different interpretation of bipolarons compared to the conventional interpretation, which I said in the beginning of the talk. So we are if you look at the conventional interpretation of bipolarons, there is very little um, attention given to the dopant anion binding, which is surprising to me since it's so strong. Um, in the conventional interpretation, they look at the binding of two polarons as kind of equivalent to what happens in superconductivity with electrons, that the binding is due to 
a net, you know, despite the fact that you have repulsion, you also have this uh, nuclear relaxation, which is stronger than the repulsion, hence you get this bipolar. I maintain in these mid-gap states, I maintain that you really, to get a bipolar, and you really need to consider the very strong Coulomb attraction between dopants and, and holes. Uh, without that, it's uh, incomplete. And uh, so we're looking at the spectral signatures. How does the AB type uh, character evolve as you increase concentration as you create bipolar? So that's the next step in this. Uh, I just want to acknowledge again, Raja Ghosh. Without him, this would not have happened. Uh, he did almost all of the uh, Polaron work. I should say Chris Pochis also kind of started the ball rolling um, with his work in 2014, but then Raja uh, took over and uh, really looked at the effect of the dopant on the Polaron uh, line shape and coherence number and so on. Uh, Mohammed is now working on bipolarons. Uh, these students are from my collaborators. So I mentioned earlier that we have a, uh, a collaboration, an NSF funded collaboration with Alberto Soleo at Stanford. He did the measurements, Christine Luscom at University of Washington. And these are the main students of theirs, uh, Annabelle Chu at, from Alberta, from Stanford and Jonathan uh, Honorado at Washington that did you know, most of the work that you've seen. So with that, I will now uh, end this yeah. and I yeah. hope I didn't go too long. No, but anyway, no, no. Uh, no, I, thanks I, for, for putting up with me. <laughs> no, no, thanks, Frank. That was fantastic. I would like to um, tell all my colleagues to actually give a big round of applause. This is a, this is a lot of work, very detailed work, and very uh, has so much clarity. Um, that That's always been a signature of you. It's simple, simple models, and then a very, very clear interpretation. So I, I, I would request um, uh, the audience to now ask questions. I'm sure uh, there are many questions. I have questions. Um, so uh, Sandeep Ghosh, um, Professor Sandeep Ghosh, one of my colleagues from physics, is uh, wants to ask a question. Sandeep? Uh, am I audible? Yes. Yeah, I can yeah. hear. So, um, uh, so th thank you for a very nice talk. Uh, I, my question is the following. In uh, people who deal with uh, inorganic materials, uh, their uh, vanier mott excitons are the things that we normally uh, come across. Uh, and their dimensionality uh, of the exciton is an important thing. Now, when you talk about um, uh, an intralayer exciton here, as opposed to something which is extended to uh, you know adjacent layers also, uh, do you are you also saying that there is a dimensionality that you have to consider for these things? Oh, yeah. Oh, definitely. Um, in the last series of talks, I mean, I've devoted a good many years to this, to, uh, uh, to the simple problem of, of this. Suppose you have a J aggregate, one dimension, like I just said. Um, I don't know if you can see my fingers. Yes, can we, can. we can. So we can. you have one J aggregate here where we're talking about intra-chain exciton motion. And then you bring up because there is dimensionality in a real example, it's not just one dimension. You might have a pi stack and a pi stack or a polymer and a polymer. And now you have a very interesting situation where you have J-like along the, along the chain axis and H-like because they're side by side, Kasha, right? You can imagine this could be H in the interchain and J in the intra-chain. And so you get what we call an H-J aggregate. And it has very different features from either the pure H or the pure J. And so dimensionality is hugely important. And only now, and there, there's some excellent work by uh, a young faculty member at UCLA named Justin Karam, who's also doing uh, HJ aggregates. And we have this little dispute because I call them HJ and guess what he calls them? This is, it's I. I is between H and J, right? <laughs> and so I'm saying, hey, call him HJ. That's what I call him. No, I'm going to call him I. Hey, you're going to confuse people. All right, I is between H and J. But anyway, yes, there's a, it's kind of a hybrid response between a H aggregate and a J aggregate due to the higher dimensionality. So you're exactly right. Dimensionality is huge. And in that respect, also for the Polaron, I didn't really talk about it. But, um, you have uh, very important anisotropies in the, in the mid IR. If you could control, uh, you could make a very oriented sample and then uh, do a polarization analysis where you keep your electric field along the chain and between chains, 
you would see a difference. So there is an anisotropic response due to, again, higher dimensionality. So very, very important. Okay, thanks, thanks. Thank you, Sandeep. Uh, I think Ravi, you have a question? Yeah, I did. Thanks for the talk, Frank. It was uh, very enlightening, actually. Uh, I don't believe these things are that simple, actually, really. <laughs> Um, but nevertheless, uh, for the polaron, uh, you know, for your polaron analysis, analysis of polaron spectra with the chemical dopants, right? With the anion, um, I yeah, I didn't quite follow essentially as to why the dimer is such a fundamental entity. Actually, is it just a size effect? Is it just a size effect of the anion, or you know? Well, okay, uh, yeah, I kind of I. So in the in the confirmation that I chose. I chose the anion to be situated exactly in the middle. Of course, that's my choice. I could have chose it, chosen it to be directly across from a thiophene ring or from a chromophore unit. When it's in the middle, of course, the Coulomb binding will be equal to the, to the nearest neighbor thiophene units, which I called one and two, and then you get dimer behavior. If I had chosen it to be directly across from a single thiophene unit, then that mm. single thiophene unit would be much lower energy yeah. than the remaining and you would get a different response, I agree. However, in this difference of those two cases, dimer versus monomer, is only really important when the anion is really up close and personal. For actual distances, which um, in, in, in reality, so you're at least say 0.6 nanometers or greater, more like 0.8, uh, then you do that experiment where you're across, uh, directly across, so you, you localize a monomer versus a dimer, the difference is very small when you're, as you pull the anion away. Um, in actual calculations, we average over this kind of longitudinal displacement. I just, uh, it helps to understand the Hertzberg-Teller mechanism in a dimer, it's the easiest uh, example. So I kind of stress that, but uh, there is no real, um, you know, you don't create dimers in, in, in real polymer samples. In fact, you don't see that intense blue shift uh, that would be uh, uh, indicative of a dimer because the anions never get really that close. I mean, you remember that uh, spectrum I showed, the anion was 0.2 nanometers from, which is totally unphysical. You can't get, that's like a chemical bond distance, right? You mm. can't get that. Close. A realistic distance is four times that, in which case the uh, spectrum doesn't really um, show a huge difference between that monomer-like configuration and a dimer-like. Right? But in any respect, we do average over it just to be sure. Okay, nice. so yeah, that was just to simplify the discussion more than an actual physical okay. reality. Okay. okay, and I had like a, sorry, can I uh, ask one more or is it? Yeah, yeah Ravi, Ravi, we will have that interaction also. So I think, sure. can I take no, no, a just... question? Yeah, a YouTube question. Sorry, Ravi, uh, not cutting you off, but you know, I'll just take. Of course you are, but that's okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, excuse me for that. Um, so there is there is a uh, question. There are two questions from YouTube. Um, Professor Spano, as Alfie Benny from Isaiah Tiruvananthapuram, he asks, is Mahesh Hariharan student? Just to remind you, Frank. Um, uh, Professor Spano, in the polymer system, when one of the ring is excited, will there be any change in the dihedral angles? And as a consequence, can we consider coupling uh, with the J coupling as constant? As constant. Yeah. Ah, okay. I see what you're saying. Yeah. I, I skimmed over a lot of, of real life complexities. Um, yes, there is torsional disorder in realistic samples. So they're not exactly perfectly planar chains. I mean, that would be a myth. I would not. However, when you aggregate, it does increase planarity just hysterically if you think about it, right? Um, but, uh, if, you know, if you noticed in the I'm afraid to go back in my slides because I think I'm going to screw this up. But let me just um, in re so in re so to a kind of account for torsional disorder, we include uh, disorder. We call it site disorder. Um, but uh, if you want to, but we've also included disorder with respect to um, the uh, J E X or T H. So that's what you were getting at. Um, if you change the torsional angle between two thiophene units, you will of course change the coupling between those two units. Um, and that will impact whether, you know, the, it could possibly impact whether you have J or H, but most likely it'll change the magnitude. 
So uh, what I'm trying to show here very sluggishly is the Hamel here. So we do have a disorder term here, which crudely accounts, I mean, there's just so many ways to screw up a sample basically to uh, a sample. So uh, kind of like in the Fermi approach, you just include it as a, a normally distributed uh, kind of Gaussian site energy fluctuations. This is in line with uh, some of the seminal pioneering work of um, Hans Bossler, who wrote about disordered organic materials in the 70s. Um, and he talked about, you know, how holes are disordered and how excitons are disordered in, or how it reflects the disorder, the energy reflects disorder, but you're right. Um, and, and in our calculations and a lot of our papers, we do include also um, this kind of intersite disorder that you, that would be caused by torsional disorder in, um, in our simulations. Um, but I just didn't have time to really get into it. But yes, it's a very important consideration. Okay, okay. Um, uh, and th there are uh, two questions and then we will have a short interaction with a uh, um, couple of our members. So the first question by Gursaheb, what does the B band signify in doped and undoped films? The B band. B band okay, so as I told you, um, it's a good question. I mean, the uh, B band conventionally is called P1. Okay, so you can always get a B band. Let's suppose I got rid of vibrational coupling and just did the uh, Hamiltonian without vibration. So get rid of the Holstein and just do, uh, you know, uh, electronic coupling only like a Frankel. You'll always get a B band. So um, a B band reflects transitions within the one polymer manifold of the one polaron uh, manifold of states. Okay, so um, it really is similar in some respects to the uh, conventional P1 in that respect. So it's just transitions from one polymer ground, I keep saying polymer, from a one polar on ground state to a one polar on excited. So in other words, you still have one hole. Right. Um, so uh, yeah, so, so that's what uh, I would then, uh, how I would uh, classify the absorption there. So B is a pure, has its nature, its origin in pure electronic transitions. Whereas A re absolutely requires vibronic coupling. It vanishes, I didn't show this, but it vanishes completely if you say set lambda squared to zero. Right. So get rid of vibronic coupling. Okay. And, and the question was, why was it blue shifting? That, that's the, just a little part of the question. Why was it blue shifting? Because of these, I, I guess, because of the coupling of the anion and the hole, right? So, so yeah, the blue, sh okay. I'm not gonna try to go back into the slides, but. <laughs> Um, the blue shift of the B band now you're talking yes. about, right? Yes. So, the, so as you localize, now what does localization mean? You're bringing in closer and closer, like, you know, like the Jaws music, and, 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 and you're bringing in that negative, it's, it's drawing in, it's localizing the hole, right. right? And so as it localizes, just think particle in a box. Yep. So what happens to the manifold of states? They spread out and B increases. It right. blue shifts. Okay. Okay. So, yeah, thanks, Frank. Um, I will take the rest of the questions. Gursa, have for the, the the other question, what is the reason for high and low radiative rate uh, decay rate uh, for the J and H aggregate? I think we will refer to Frank's other earlier uh, tutorial sessions uh, where he discussed um, uh, in depth uh, in the ISC TIFR uh, webinar series uh, the reason for this. So we will we'll pick that up. Uh, maybe you can pick that up and we can have a discussion uh, later. Um, in interest of time, because we have to end the colloquium session, I would uh, uh, really uh, sort of um, end the session here formally. And I would like to thank again, Professor Spano for wonderful lecture and his continuous effort to teach us uh, over the last few months <laughs> uh, on aggregates, optical excitations and aggregates. And now joining a little bit uh, more in a new way uh, the effects of polarons, looking at polarons. Um, I will uh, share some of the questions and discussions after this colloquium ends. So could you please stay back for 15 minutes as I end this uh, session? Sure. Um, and thank you okay. very much for the invitation again. It was a pure pleasure and honor to thank you. be thank invited. You. By you. Thank you, Professor Spano. And um, for the rest of the audience, thank you for joining in and staying for this day. Um, our next colloquium, 
is by a biologist from Iser Pune, Sudha Rajamani, who is going to talk about origins of life. Okay, so mm -hmm. I hope uh, you all join us at four o'clock next week on a Wednesday, and that is the twentieth of January. Okay, so thank you all, and I would now actually stop the uh, live session, and I would like to thank um, Rajesh Mistri and co colleagues in the auditorium for beaming this talk also locally in the auditorium. Thank you for doing that. And uh, with that, I conclude. Uh,